the highlight of my week, church. Singing with you, hearing that just come forward like a tidal wave. Woo! I hope I don't have stuff all over my face from those Kleenexes. That was fantastic. Thank you, sister. Woo! Good morning. I hope you had a good week. If not, that's okay, because you came to the right place, because God is good, even when it doesn't feel like it, even when we get a bad phone call, a bad diagnosis, even when something goes horribly wrong, it doesn't change God. God is still good. Today, we're going to look at a really powerful, sobering topic called the need for approval, and whose approval are we really, really seeking? Now, remember, it's the potter's hand, so you're safe here. We have a lot of guests always each and every week. If you're online joining us, welcome. Great to have you too. It's okay if the message challenges you because remember, they challenged me first. All five days leading up to this, as I was researching, God was spanking me and it was awesome. Thank you, sir. May I have another? It was one of those things. Before you get their spankings, just know it always comes through me first. All right? We're all safe. Everybody nod. You're on the same page with me. How many people have ever heard of this satire magazine online? Anybody raise your hand if you know the Babylon Bee. Oh my goodness, no way. Only six people? Okay, you're in for a treat. You need to go find this, okay? I do not endorse everything, but this is a Christian comedy satire. It's fake news on purpose, okay? Hear me say that. Because a lot of, part of the funniest part is reading the comments of people who don't get that this is satire. And they're like, oh, what? How do you say that? And it's like, it's just a joke. It's satire, okay? It's put on by Christians for Christians. So it naturally pokes a little fun at us, okay? And sometimes you're like, hoo hoo, amen. Other times you're like, huh, oh me. Because it hits a little <laughs> close to home. Well, this particular article that came out, it was so good, I had to share it with you. It goes perfectly with today, all right? Here's the headline Man reminds himself he is sharing in Christ's sufferings after his Facebook post gets zero <laughs> likes. All right. Now, some of you, you need to wake up and get this, because this is funny. This is, this is good stuff right here. This guy's name is Michael Mayhew, okay? He's a local believer, and the article says he's a sales associate local believer, and he's known for his constant barrage of political and religious memes and links and lengthy pontifications on Facebook, which he calls edifying to the body. But apparently, not everyone appreciates his intellect and his vast biblical knowledge. Michael Mayhew was painfully reminded of Jesus' prediction that his disciples would one day experience fiery trials and persecutions in this world because Thursday afternoon, not a single person liked or shared or commented on his profound post laying out the biblical case for capitalism. He goes, yes, wait for it. He goes on to say, after enduring approximately one full hour of scathing ridicule in the form of total silence from his Facebook friends, Michael humbly went online and commented on his own post, <laughs> quoting John 15. Remember the word that I said to you. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. <laughs> when a reporter said, how could you possibly endure such intense persecution? He replied, every time, every time someone ignores me or unfriends me, I just remember they unfriended Jesus first. <laughs> He went on to say, but it's all okay in the weight of the eternal glory that God is preparing for me through this trial. <laughs> Church, if that doesn't summarize the modern need for approval, I don't know what will. And today with social media, we have a whole new avenue for feeling worthless and for feeling <laughs> unliked and unfriended and unshared. This is, a, this is exactly what we're talking about today. Who do we live for? Do we seek God's approval or do we seek man's approval? So let's just begin by asking a very probing question, okay? Don't answer out loud. Whose approval do you seek? On a day-to-day -day basis, when you're going through your day, when you walk in the office, when you're at home, when you're out and about, whose approval are you really after? Is it your peers? Is it fellow students? Is it your coworkers? Maybe your boss? Is it your spouse? Is it God? Whose approval do we really seek on a day-to-day? -day? Because so many people would trade anything to be liked. 
and to be accepted and to have the approval and the applause of man. But hear me, church, that is a dangerous trap. It's shallow and it is so fleeting. The desire to be liked, to have man's approval, I promise it is nothing new. It's not a new thing. Jesus dealt with it all the way back in biblical times. In fact, in Matthew 16, he says this. He says, listen, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Well, that doesn't sound like a path to popularity to me. That sounds like a pretty sobering reminder. And he goes on to say, whoever would save his life is going to lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And here's where he really digs down. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? Maybe we should say, what does it profit a man if he gains a thousand Facebook followers or 1,800 retweets or shares? What does it profit you if you gain all that yet you lose your own soul in the process? What will you trade for your soul? See, God's kingdom is upside down. It is totally different than the world's systems. It is totally different in the world's values. The things that we look up to and the things that disciples are looking up to and the things that the world holds in high esteem, they're so different. Have you noticed that? Have you come into that? Have, I hope we have as disciples, as followers of Christ, I hope we are living in such a way that we have a little bit of a difference in the way we speak, the way we carry ourselves, the way we act, the way we dress, the way we play. The way we vote, the way we go about our daily routines, do we resemble Christ or do we resemble the world? Because friendship with the world is actually enmity. That means, that means conflict with Christ. Man, pastor, you're going to hit us with that? It's not even 11 yet. It's awful early. I haven't had brunch. You're coming out of the block with that? Oh, just wait. Wait till you see what Jesus has to say to us next. We're going to look at some amazing stuff. In fact, go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Pull up your favorite Bible app. If you're following online digitally, I'm going to read from the CSB today, the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB. While you do that, let me welcome our online campus. Last week, we had some families in Connecticut we said hello to. This week, we have some special guests all the way up in Jeffersonville, Indiana. Tom and Diane, special welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. We found out each and every week. Great to have you with us. All right, everybody got it? Matthew 6, follow along, look at verse 1. He says this, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you do it, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be applauded by men. Oh, you're so great, yes. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But you, when you give to the poor... Don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that your giving may be done in, what's that word? Secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Verse 5. Whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and up on the street corners to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they've got their reward. But when you pray, go into your private room. Shut your door and pray to your father who's in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't babble like the, I love that word, don't babble like the Gentiles. Since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them. Because your father knows the things you need before you ask him. Wow. Think about what he just said. So right away, there's something, when I was studying this, that, Right off the bat, I found something that seemed kind of strange to me. Did you catch it? If you're familiar with Matthew 5, which, by the way, this is the Sermon on the Mount. That's how you know we're in the meaty, meaty scriptures today. The granddaddy of all sermons. This is it. In Matthew 5, just one verse, Jesus says, we just read, Be careful not to practice your righteous acts in front of others. But then he says, You are the light of the world. And no one lights a lamp under a basket you know, and hides it. Instead, you put it up on a lampstand so everyone can see by it. Think about that. Does that not seem kind of contradictory? Right here, we're told just a few seconds ago, don't be doing your righteous acts in front of everybody for that public acclaim. And then, just one chapter earlier, it says, let your light shine. Let people see your good works. Let people see your... And here is 
the key thing. Look at Matthew 5. Notice this. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. So how do we put those two together? Does that not seem a little strange to anybody? The answer to this awkward question is in the very next line. Read it with me. It says, they will glorify who? Your Father in heaven. Oh, man, that's it. That changes everything. This is a hidden gem. Who we are doing these good works for. And the motivation means everything. Jesus is warning us flat out about the why we do what we do. That makes all the difference in the world, apparently, to the Lord. Think about it. In one instance, we've got one person who's doing good works to be seen for him, for people to clap for him, to bring glory to him. Yet on the other hand, we see the other example of a humble person who's doing good works and acts of righteousness for everyone to see him and glorify him and be giving praise to him, not to ourselves. Who we give glory to and who we are motivated to do the good work for matters everything. Think about this. This makes a difference not only to the Lord, but it makes a difference to the reward you may or you may not be receiving. Think about that. There is more to this life than just this life. And we don't hear that message anymore. But they're so true. We're supposed to be godly and heavenly minded. There are great things awaiting those who love God and love people and thereby go and serve God and serve people. Jesus says, hey, you want to be great? Be a servant. Don't be the one who sits there and has your feet washed. Man, you beat them to it. You get on your knees. You be the one who washes the feet. That is so upside down. We don't hear that taught anymore. Everybody says, go get what you coming to you. Go, go out. You make your own way. Hear me. Jesus is not prohibiting public acts of righteousness. He's not at all. What he is condemning, he is warning us the motivation is to always bring glory to God and not to ourselves. Can you imagine that? This, this guy, I mean, he's, look at me. I'm about to do a good deed. <laughs> Everybody praise me. Everybody, do I have everybody's attention? I'm going to give my offering now. <laughs> and it is a huge check. In fact, I'm going to leave it open so you can see it when you come by as well. <laughs> you can marvel at my generosity. <laughs> Hashtag humble brag. Hmm? Right? You all know what I'm talking about. So here's the big idea for us today. According to scripture, achieving success in this life is not about getting man's approval. It's a trap. If you're on that, you're in a safe place. Get off that hamster wheel. It will never be enough. Our goal is to seek God's approval. Look at verse 2 with me. He goes on to say, So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you do it, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets. Wow, can you picture that? Don't do it to be applauded by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. Pastor, did people really do that? Or is this just more spiritual hyperbole? Did people really, really? You know what? We're, we're, we're going to look at this. I, I need a volunteer. Somebody... Volunteer to help me with an offering. You won't get hurt. Elias, you want to do it? You, you look very timid. It was kind of like a half. To, yeah, you do, you do? You do? All right, come on up. Come on up. Corey, you going to help me with this? All right, let's do this. Elias, you take this chair and set this in the center of the platform right up there in that glow. All right, we're going we're gonna to. I was thinking about this this week, and I said, you know what? We, we have got to experiment and see what this is like. I want this to be something that we never forget. Raise your hand if you've ever been to a mall. The rest of you are lying, because I know you've been to a mall. Your wallet's as empty as mine is. I know. Don't pretend. You're safe here, right? How many have ever seen this kind of thing in a mall? Anybody, anybody know what this is? One of them. Yes, it's one of them coin things. Oh, have you guys done this? Have you have you been to a coin thing? You know what I'm talking? About? Yeah, you know, these things are addictive. I kid you not. This is full confession, right? We're all in this together. I've been giving to those, I don't even know what charity I'm giving to. And I'm happy to put my coins in because they circle around and they go around and around and you're mesmerized and it gets faster and faster. As it gets closer to the funnel, it goes into this big chest of money. I can't tell you how much money I've given to charities I don't even know what they are. In fact, I've been sitting there, I've been like, Milo, you got any money to come out? We gotta get some. Dad, I wasn't going to give it. Just give me the money. we got to do this. This is so cool. Go get it changed for pennies. And we can do it like 100 times. Right? See what I'm saying? It's addictive. Just like that, back then, before the temple, before you climbed the steps, there were 
large cones hammered out of metal, we think possibly bronze, and they were these big funnels. And what they did, here you go, here's your offering, get it ready. They would put the coins in, there was, it was originally for security reasons, because you couldn't reach in and steal from the offering, which man, heaven help you if you're stealing from the temple offering. But if the guards somehow didn't catch that, there's another side note to the giving. is loud. And you couldn't help but notice. But check out what scripture says. Scripture says they also blew a trumpet. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to practice this, okay? Go ahead and do it. Just give a couple handfuls at a time, put it in the funnel, going into the chest. You drop some in. Before you do it, go ahead and play us a little ditty so that people know he's about to give his offering. Anything you got, just hit it out. There it is. Ladies and gentlemen, I am giving my offering now. Drop it in. Just drop just, just There you go. Good. Keep going. All right, another one. Keep it going. I'm continuing to give my offering. <laughs> All right. Yes. Let's go offering. That is it. That is it. And it is a great offering. I wish you could all see that I am giving my offering because it is exceedingly generous. <laughs> Charge. And perhaps by all of this fanfare and giving, you will feel inspired. And you come up. And you can give. And you can give. And you... Everybody, just dump it all in. Yes! I am so humble and proud of my humility. Now, imagine this. This is, this is one example. Do you see how insane this is? But what if Elias had a twin brother? And his twin brother came over with a $5 bill and walked this way. And while this fanfare was going on, he dropped the same amount of money into that treasure chest and humbly went on his way without his hype man. Without the bugle. Good job, buddy. Give him a hand, guys. Thank you. That was awesome. Do you see how crazy that would be? But that's what Scripture's saying we shouldn't do. We say, Pastor, we have never done that. We would never do anything to bring it to... Yeah. There's, there's the awkward laugh. So what do we do? How can we tell if we are giving or praying or doing any good deed with a pure motive? This passage, this text gives us a secret. It is so powerful. It is so simple. If you're serious, keep listening. If not, go ahead and fall asleep right here, okay, because it's going to get deep fast. If you are serious and you want to know about the purity of your motive, ask yourself this one simple question right here. In other words, let me put it a different way. What about this? Can I keep it a secret? Would I still do this good work if no one ever found out about it? If the answer is no, better check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> better check your motive here. Jesus is saying, don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Can we do a good deed? Can we do a good work in this modern day and age without posting it to Instagram? Right? We even hashtag, like, hashtag blessed. I'm so blessed. Hashtag humble brag. You know what a humble brag is? For your brag, but you look humble doing it? Like, this is a perfect example right here. I take great pride in my humility. That's, that's so wrong. Yet we see it all the time. This is what Jesus is talking about. He's giving us a surefire way to test our motives. Ask yourself this question. Will you do your, right, your act of righteousness if no one ever knew? If you would, then perhaps your motive is, is, is perfect. Y'all, some of you are awesome at this. Just last week, just last week after church was over, a family quietly came up and said, we want to bless a family in this church that has some needs, but we don't want to get any credit. We don't want them to know about it. Can we give you some money and you quietly find a way to get it to them that's detached from us? Because we want no credit. We don't want them to ever find out. Now, let me ask you something. You think Jesus just might be happy with that act of worship? And that's awesome. And so many, that's one of my joys of being a pastor. They choose the church to be the conduit of that. And I'm like, yes, we can do that. It'll be our secret. It's beautiful. What a humble act of worship. 
Those people will never know who it was who came forward and blessed them. That has to please God based on what we just read. And listen, that, that's a test of our motives. If you fail that test, it's okay. God will bring it back around again. You can keep taking that test. As, as, as Mr. Cook says, he says, we can't fail God's test, but we get to take them again and again and again until we pass. The humility test is something that will be ours forever. Now, lest we think this is just an adult thing, Kids, younglings, you're not out of the woodwork. There was a test, a study, a survey done in the Scientific American. They posted this, an actual scientific poll, from 10 to 12-year-olds. And they asked them, what was their number one desire in all of the world? Guess what their answer was? It wasn't to do something significant. It wasn't a great heroic act of, of uh, selfless love. It wasn't even financial independence or financial security or becoming a productive member of society. Do you know what their number one desire, ages 10 to 12, said? This, this, this should shock you. It was one word. Are you ready for this? Their number one desire was that. Fame. I just want to be famous. Church, that's sobering. Can you imagine? Of all the things that's in, this is so revealing about our desire to... to live to please man when Jesus says, no, 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 you live for an audience of one, seeking only his approval. So young people, let me ask you this. As your friendly neighborhood pastor, how are you doing with that? Whose approval do you wake up for? When you go to school, whose approval are you seeking? Because as followers of Christ, we seek the audience of one and his approval. Adults, you're not off the hook. How about you? How are you doing with that? Is this our motivator? I would never do that, really. Check your motives. It's okay. If it zings a little, that's good. That means, by the way, if, if, you're, if you're visiting with us, we like to be challenged here. It's a good thing. There's no, nobody here got it all together. Amen? We, we don't pretend. There's no pretenders allowed. In fact, we're going to have a new slogan. I think, Chris, go ahead and put that up. No perfect people allowed here, okay? And if you look like that, I don't, man, we're jealous, okay? So we're just going to get over that together and confess. There's no perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. Now, he's welcome, but if you pretend to be perfect, well, you know what? Maybe you are allowed because this is where you need to be. Because, hey, nobody got it all together. We all need to be challenged. We all need that. Now, remember, this passage isn't just about good deeds, lest you think it's just about money. This is also about prayer. Look what he says next in verse 5. He says, whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues or on the street corners to be seen by the people. Truly, I'm telling you, they have their reward. This is so foreign to me. I can't tell you the last time I drove by and saw some guy standing up. Imagine how bizarre that would be. Can you imagine having a conversation like, hey, how you doing? Hey, did you watch the game? Wow, can you believe the Citadel beat Alabama? And this guy just interrupts and goes, excuse me, it is time for prayer. Oh, Lord, I thank you that I am not like these losers. We can't even imagine that. It's so foreign to us. This is what Jesus is dealing with. He comes up, and he, I love how he's so blunt. Look what he calls him. Look at the word. It starts with an H. Hypocrites. Do you know what that means? That's literally one who wears a mask to hide who he really is. He is so blunt. He's calling them pretenders. In this case, they're pretending to be spiritually close to a heavenly father. They probably don't even know. And Jesus is calling them out. But the other thing that jumped out at me as I was reading this is their posture. Are they seated? Are they kneeling? It says they're standing. This was a very proud way to pray. The way it's written implies that they actually were striking a pose. <laughs> Look at me, I'm about to pray. Won't you be impressed with my great prayer? And they always prayed in King James. Even back then, it was just a weird thing they did. They always, and they had a British accent. And they just prayed these prayers. Oh, Father, we thank thee that we aren't stuffed underneath thy toenails. And they go on and on. And, just, and it's, he even uses the word babbling. I love that. He is, so, he is so calling him out. In fact, the Pharisees were so rigid. Did you know they prayed four times a day minimum? And they did it at 6 a.m., then again at 9 a.m., then again at 12, and then again at 3. Now, here's the funny part. Every time they prayed and they had these 3 o'clock little breaks, they always just so happened to be in a public place where the maximum amount of people could see them. Isn't that a coincidence? No, it's not a coincidence. It reveals their heart. Every time. Like, they're going to go find temple steps. Oh, 259, excuse me. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and 
And they go into the, can you imagine? Jesus is saying, that's a show, and they've got the reward. Don't do that. So what is Jesus saying to us? Are we supposed to never pray in public? I mean, are we supposed to just hide our faith? We, we just were told we're the light of the world. What is going on? Again, Jesus is warning us against performing for public. He is looking at our hearts and cutting to the core as only he can do and saying, I rebuke that public prayer that is self-serving. But anytime you want to commune with your heavenly father, do it. He encourages us to pray. In fact, look what Jesus says next. Look, look at verse 6. He says, but when you pray, now, by the way, did you notice that second word isn't if? But if you pray, the assumption is you're going to pray. You're supposed to be a follower of mine. But when you pray, he's assuming you do it. How are you doing with that? Okay, we'll come back to that. That's a different sermon then, apparently. We'll, we'll work on that. When you pray, go into your private room, shut your door, and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Some of your translations may even say reward you openly. Verse 7, when you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, because your father knows the things you need before you ask. The first hidden gem right here are those first three words where he says, go to your private room. You know what the Greek word is here? It's a really cool word. You want to learn it. You want to use it at lunch and impress your friends. It's temeion. Temeion literally means a room with no doors and no windows. So how do you get in? It's no doors or windows to the exterior. You see the difference? These are rooms only accessible by being on the interior. When I was just a young whippersnapper, uh, Lynn Rumley and Steve Rumley and my wife and I, we were, we were out and we were going somewhere, I think on a conference, and we needed a hotel. And she said, don't you get no motel, you get a hotel, Pastor. What's the difference? Oh, you don't know? The motel are the kind where the doors open to the outside, where you're sitting there, you're brushing your teeth, and someone comes in, you can see the truckers, everybody driving, like, how you doing? Okay, close the door. A hotel are the doors that open to the inside, where it's nicer and it's protected. And I'm like, wow, that's what he's talking about. He's saying, your private room should only be accessible from within, the privacy of the interior. That is such a far cry from those standing proudly on the steps, shouting out their prayers and saying all these things. Again, don't miss the meaning of what Jesus said. He's not prohibiting public prayer. He wants us to pray. He is prohibiting us performing for a human audience. And he even goes on to say, don't babble. Every time I hear the word babble, I think, be, 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 be. he's going on and on, thinking you're impressing God. Should I mention? I'm going to mention this. this growing up, I'm not proud. Of, I don't recommend it because I can't remember what all's in it. But there was a scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail when I was just a young little lad where these monks were walking through the street. And they were chanting a prayer. And they were saying, and I actually have the Latin here. They were, they were going through this prayer. It said, Pie Jesu Domine, Dona Eos Requiem. Which means, Christ, have mercy on us, grant us rest. The punchline comes when as they finish every prayer chant, they immediately whack themselves in the head with this two-by-four looking book or Bible. And it is so funny. There we go. Boom. And they do it. And it's so funny because it highlights exactly what Jesus is talking about. It is so, it's lunacy. This is an act of piety God's not even asking for. Yet these monks are going through the streets, being seen by men, chanting in some strange, obscure language that's long dead, and they're going through, and they're, they're banging themselves in the head. The only thing this is going to get is a headache. It's not going to get God's attention. Our prayers are for our Heavenly Father, the one who sees, quote, in secret and rewards us. Jesus is encouraging his disciples to pray. Hear me. And to pray often, and to pray at night, and to pray in the day, and to pray when you're in your car, when that guy cuts you off again, and when that other guy doesn't use the turn signal on the way to church. What is his deal? Is that just me? <laughs> okay, good. Jesus is not forbidding prayer. He's forbidding public acts of righteousness for our sake. All true disciples are supposed to pray. We're just supposed to do things not for the approval of man. We're supposed to do it for the audience of one. Every act of righteousness that we do, do we do it for an audience of one? See, when we worship and when we sing, we sing for an audience of one. Some of my sweetest times are when I can forget that anybody else is beside me. How about you? And you just, you don't care. You're at the throne. 
when we worship, when we give, when we speak, when we pray, we are speaking with an audience of one. This really, really, really hit home for me this week. You know why? Because I was invited by the mayor to come to the town council meeting the day after tomorrow to the city hall and open their meeting with prayer <laughs> of all weeks. Now, let me say, you don't think this sermon is going to be loudly ringing in my ears when I stand up? I can promise you, I am going to be so, so doing my very best to make sure that even though there's people all around, I am speaking with an audience of one, that my heart is right. I'm not there to impress people. I'm there at a request to commune with the Father on behalf of people around. I'm speaking, communicating with him, ignoring those around as I'm not here to impress them. We're here to concern ourselves solely with God's approval, not the approval of others. Now, back it up to the very beginning. You remember the question I asked when we started? Would I still do this good work? Would I still do this deed? Would I still give this offering? Would I still do it if no one knew and no one ever found out about it? Well, that question is going to be your challenge for the week. Okay, your challenge is this. Do something this week to advance the kingdom that only God knows you did it. Okay? That's your challenge. It could be a, a friendly gesture that no one sees. It could be some act of kindness. It could be a financial gift left for someone. It could be picking up the tab for somebody in line behind you at the drive-thru. It could be any of those things. Just do something this week that only God will know you did. Don't even know, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And it is beautiful. When you do this, know this. Your act of righteousness is pleasing to God. And that's whose approval we seek. Let's pray about it. Bow with me. God, I thank you for your sobering words that are such a challenge. Lord, forgive us individually, corporately, for any time that we've done things out of selfish motive. Lord, there's just no place for that in, in your kingdom. So we ask that you would forgive us. We humble ourselves before you, Lord, and we pray that you would show us the truth, that you would convict us of any act of unrighteousness or any deed that we did that was self-serving. And may we be followers of Jesus and do as he says. To not even let our left hand know what our right hand is doing. To not be out for self-glory or for the praise of man. Lord, forgive us. Help us to be about your business. To sing for an audience of one. To worship an audience of one. To give for an audience of one. As we speak with you, our audience of one. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. As we sing this final song, Lord, I pray you would move in our hearts. You are welcome in this place as the audience of one, the one we worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.